good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, this is the Hawaiian Affairs Committee hearing, and this is for GM 526, submitting for consideration and confirmation as a deputy to the chairperson for Department of Hawaiian Homelands, gubernatorial nominee Katie Ducat, for a term to expire 12-7-26. And I'm Senator Miley Shimabukuro, chair of the Hawaiian Affairs Committee. Other members include Vice Chair Kurt Favela, Senator Ihara, Keoha Kalole, and Richards. This hearing is being streamed live on YouTube. You can find links to viewing options for all Senate hearings and meetings on the live and on-demand video page of the legislature's website. If you're interested in seeing the written testimony, go to capital.hawaii.gov. In the unlikely event we must abruptly end this hearing due to major technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business and a public notice will be posted. For those testifying remotely, all your audio will be muted and video disabled until it's your turn. And as is our practice, there's a two minute time limit per testifier. If there are any temporary technical glitches during your turn, we may have to move on to the next person due to time constraints. We appreciate your understanding and remind you that the committee has already received your written testimony. And members, please wait to ask questions for the testifiers until we've gone through all the testifiers for this measure. Okay, and so first up, we have the um, Dr. Josh Green, Governor in Support. We've got the Attorney General, also in support. And then we've got um, Department of Wine Homelands in support. Chair Colley Watson. Chair uh, Shimabu Kuro and Vice Chair Favela and Senator Yahara. Uh, my name is Kali Watson. I'm here to testify in support of uh, Katie Ducat. Uh, in the short time that I've been uh, working with her, I'd have to say that I was very, very impressed with her knowledge, not only based on having worked there as a deputy AG assigned to that specific department, but also her ability to work with people, which is really important uh, for me as a director that uh, I have somebody that I can turn to when needed to take care of specific issues. In particular, I was impressed with her handling of uh, one of the major issues, which is our funding for broadband. Uh, you know, we're talking $90 million, which was put in jeopardy based on uh, prior activity. So she kind of jumped into it, got well versed in the, the uh, situation and uh, has taken steps to salvage that funding. So that was one example. Another was uh, working with the enforcement branch. That's a big thing with the department enforcement. And so she has been very uh, diligent in pushing uh, that particular uh, group of uh, enforcement that uh, is needed in order to keep things under control. In addition to that, uh, I've seen her in action. Uh, she's a very active type of individual, uh, asks a lot of questions, uh, looks for solutions, is a result-oriented individual. And that's what we need in the department, especially with us moving forward on implementing not only the, uh, you know, the strategic plan, that's going to take a lot of effort. And I, I need, you know, that's going to be my focus. So I need somebody kind of uh, working on some of the other issues that I can rely on and depend on so that the department as a whole can operate efficiently and effectively. But overall, I'd say uh, she'd be a good, good addition to uh, the department and I look forward to you folks hopefully uh, uh, agreeing with me and moving forward with her nomination to the full Senate. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate the testimony. Um, next we have Department of Transportation and Support. I think it's Nipin might be on Zoom. <coughs> Is it there IT? DOT? Hey, Chair, they're currently not on Zoom. Okay, we can come back if um, if he does come. Let, let me know. Um, Department of Public Safety and support. <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah, we, know we, the feeling. we know the feeling. I said our written testimony support. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Department of Labor and Industrial Relations and support. We've got DLNR support. Hi, Laura. Uh -huh. 
Aloha Chair, Vice Chair, Senator Ihara, Laura Ka'akua on behalf of DLNR. The department stands on our testimony and support, and I just wanted to add a few personal observations. Um, Miss, I, I've uh, been witness to Miss Ducat being able to, from memory, cite to certain um, what you revise statutes or administrative rules. And so I think with the, the really large challenge ahead for DHHL, that, that um, on-the-job experience and full legal understanding of um, ways in which the department can, can use its statutes and rules to move forward these um, housing projects, I think that'll be very uh, invaluable for the department and the Department of Land and Natural Resources really looks forward to working with Ms. Dukat as Deputy Director. Mahalo. Thank you very much. Next, we have the ETS um, Chief Information Officer in support. Um, Department of Budget and Finance, these are all in support. Um, the Department of Taxation. Also got um, Department of Human Services, Department of Health, Hawaii Public Housing Authority, Hawaii Department of Agriculture. We've got um, Chris Sadayasu, support. William I. Law, former DHHL chair in support. Uh, Pauline Namuo, Hawaiian Homes Commissioner, support. Heidi Kaunamoku Teruya, also Hawaiian Homes Commissioner, supporting. Let's see, VK Productions, um, Wailu Orchids, in support. Pacific Resource Partnership, support. Omar Ka'ai, support. Okay, and then these are, let's see, Joby Masagatani, former DHL chair in support. And then um, Jane Mukogawa, support. They're on Zoom, Jaina. Matthew the chair, Devonch. they're currently not on Zoom. Okay. Matthew Devonch, support. Craig Iha, support. Jermaine Myers, support. I think she might have been on Zoom. Yes, aloha. Aloha. Aloha Chair Senator Miley, Vice Chair Senator Favela, and committee members. My name is Jermaine Myers, and I'm a non Hawaiian homestead lessee. I support the confirmation of Katie Ducat, also known as Katie Lambert, as a deputy to the chairperson for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Katie Ducat is highly qualified for this position. Similar to Tyler Gomes, the previous DHHL deputy to the chairperson, Katie has a law degree and strong legal work experiences. In 2020, I, as many others, was skeptical of Tyler Gomes at first because he didn't have years of experience in Hawaiian issues prior to his position as DHHL deputy to the chairperson. However, Tyler proved that his legal education, public defense work experiences, and the ability to review and resolve complex issues with legal consequences were essential to his success as the Deputy Director of DHHL. I believe Katie will be a successful Deputy to the Chairperson. I've attended Hawaiian Homes Commission meetings when Katie has been the Deputy Attorney General providing legal assistance to the Hawaiian Homes Commission. She communicates professionally as well as using layman terms for community members to understand her advice to the commissioners. I appreciate her positive spirit. I humbly ask for you all to support the confirmation of Katie Tukat for the DHHL deputy to the chairperson. Mahalo, kikahi e kikahi. Mahalo, Ms. Myers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. William Oku, support. William Kapako Jr., opposition. Patrick Kahabayola'a, opposition. Michelle Brown, support. And then these are all in support. Linda Rose Hill, Katrina Souza. Oh, yes. Hi, Eloha. That's Rose, Rose Hill. I usually stand in the middle. However, I would like to add one thing. I think her, Katie's, I will. She is my niece, so I have seen her since birth. Um, and I can tell you how hard she works 
and how diligent she is in all that she does. But I think one thing that I'll often be keen to hear is, is that she has the full support of her family. And you know in government that unless you have the support of your family, you can tolerate the long hours, the odd hours, the weekends, the travel, and all the other things that go with the job. It's very difficult to do without that support. And I can assure you that she has the full support of everyone in the family. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay. So yeah, so these are all in support. Katrina Souza, Shannon Cruz, Milton Motooka. Natalie um, Talamoa, Joy Kobayashi, Mary Martin, Eric Apana, Lily Ann Sora, Laura Maishiro, Jennifer Sugita, Donna Kalama, David Ka'aku, Rebecca Suzis, Kersha Durant, Brian Kanakaole, Diane Tyra, Brian Furuto. Omelani Shadel, um, Tyler Iacapa Gomes. Now, this is opposition, um, Pana Eva Hawaiian Homelands Community Association. Okay. And these are, now these are in support Kay Piltz, Kathleen Ho, Randy Awo, Leo Asuncion, Dennis Nevis, and, and, then, and then opposition, Ronald and Doreen Kodani. Is there anyone else here to testify on GM um, 526? Okay. Do you think that members any questions for the testifiers? Okay. If you want to call up the um, you have good questions, Vice Chair? Not right now. Not right now, okay. Okay, and then we'll call up then the nominee, Ms. Katie Ducat. And if you want, if you want to make a statement, feel free. If not, we can go into questions. Yeah, I would like to make a statement. Sure. Great. Great. <clears throat> Aloha Chair Shimabukuro, Vice Chair Favela, and members of the committee. I am very grateful for this opportunity to come before you as nominee for Deputy Director for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. I am honored and humbled to have been selected by Governor Green to serve in this very important role at this critical time for DHHL. I also want to thank all those who took the time to prepare and submit testimony supporting my nomination. I truly appreciate your support as well. I also want to acknowledge those who sent in opposition to my nomination. I'm aware of the concerns of beneficiaries who are opposed to my nomination because of the Kalima case. So let's start there. My familiarity with DHHL comes from having served as its legal counsel for about eight years altogether. In that role, I provided legal guidance on a variety of issues. It was also my job as one of the Deputy Attorneys General at that time to represent DHHL vigorously in litigated matters, whether that be in administrative hearings or in court proceedings. And DHHL's position in those cases are often adversarial to beneficiaries and leasees. And I know that there is consternation because in that role, I and other Deputy Attorneys Generals who represent DHHL become the face of opposition, and that is our job. That comes with the territory. I was added to the Kalima case in October of 2021. That case had decades of history and contentious litigation before I became involved. When I was added to the case, there had been a lull in the matter after it had come down from appeal a second time in 2020. And my job was to try to absorb all of that history, figure out where the case had left off, and to make sense of the massive amounts of information in an incredibly small window of time in order to move forward with what would be the, what's called the damages phase of the case. It was a Herculean task and it was heartbreaking and frustrating to realize why it was so hard to do with the way DHHL systems and files are set up. I worked extremely hard to determine application dates, lease dates, transfer dates, subdivision dates, and issues involving missing or incomplete file and claim information. And I will tell you that I am incredibly grateful that the opportunity to settle Kalima presented itself during the 2022 legislative session and that the work I did aggregating just a portion of that data was used in the effort towards resolution. And I am going to tell you right now that in my current role as deputy to the chair, DHHL will find no greater advocate in making sure that DHHL addresses the types of operational and systemic issues 
that create inefficiencies and unnecessary delays that lead to the mismanagement of trust issues. This is because of my experience with the Kaluma case, in addition to the host of other matters I've advised on. I've heard what many of you have heard, that it's a consequence of not having enough staff, of not having the money, time, or other resources to upgrade DHHL systems. That's unacceptable. The thinking needs to change. DHHL and the Commission have fiduciary duties to manage the trust well, and the kinds of breaches found in the Kalima case, for example, are not high-level concepts. They were, for the most part, operational types of issues. The duty to keep and render accounts, or in other words, to maintain proper, proper audit, auditable records, the duty to exercise reasonable care and skill, and the duty to administer the trust. In other words, to exercise such care and skill as a person of ordinary prudence would exercise in dealing with their own property, and the duty to make the trust property productive. I know it will be hard for some beneficiaries to believe or trust that I have their best interests at heart because of my association to the Kalima case and other cases that I may have worked on. I am not here to discount their feelings or beliefs. I only hope that I will be afforded a chance to show my commitment to improving the DHHL so that Prince Kuhio's vision can be realized. I'm here today because I believe in Prince Kuhio's mission. I believe that I have the qualifications to make a difference for the betterment of the trust and its beneficiaries. DHHL can and should be managed better. DHHL can be run differently, and it can and should be more efficient, more transparent, and more responsive to the beneficiaries it was created to serve. And the thing is, I am pretty sure that DHHL staff agree. They are dedicated public servants and they need help. My experience has been that staff, the administrators, they want help, but they don't know where to start. My goal is to be the positive catalyst for change, recognizing that it is not going to be easy. It will be very hard work, and I am sure it will be frustrating at many points along the way, but it needs to be done. There is too much at stake. DHHL simply cannot continue to operate the way it has been if it is going to succeed with implementing Act 279. My hope is that by focusing on improving the operational and processes of DHHL that I can support Chair Kali Watson in his vision to move forward with the Commission's strategic plan to implement Act 279 fully. I'm also excited about the ideas he has for projects outside of and beyond Act 279. But the reality is, is that DHHL can only accomplish these monumental tasks if DHHL is running on all cylinders. My goal, if allowed to serve, is to help DHHL and Kali succeed by making sure that there are processes, workflows, internal guidelines, and rules in place to streamline the matters that are important to our beneficiaries so that it is more efficient, responsive, and transparent. That way, Kali and the leaders who come after his time as chair can focus on developing homesteads for beneficiaries and so that breaches of the sort found in Kalima never happen again. Thank you again for this opportunity and I welcome any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much. Members, questions? Any questions? Oh, I'll be a lot, so I'm gonna be greedy. Okay, so my first one is, uh, how long did you serve as a state Hawaii deputy attorney? So altogether, 10 years, eight of those for DHHL. As a, as the deputy for AG, did you have any cases regarding any ethics violations regarding conflict of interest? No. You described the process and what you would use to address ethics violation and conflict of interest. I would. Um, can you, if you have, if you come across it, oh. um, how you would handle um, the violations and conflict of interest? I would recuse myself immediately, even if there's the appearance of conflict. So, um, yeah, we'll just move on. How long did you serve as a, a deputy AG for the AG show? All um, altogether about eight years. As the deputy of AG um, at DHHL, did you review and advise the DHHL staff on any issues regarding Hawaii Community Development Board, HCDB? I don't believe so, no. Are you aware there is hazardous material violations on HCDB Kalailo person? No. 
So did you attend uh, Chairman Kelly Watson's Hawaiian Committee hearing? I did. Okay, the reason why I'm saying that is because in the hearing, I had brought it up uh, yes. numerous of times. So since the hearing, did anybody from Hawaiian Homes or anybody else, because you're in reinforcement, that's what Chair Kelly Watson said. Mm -hmm. Did Since the hearing, did you go and look into those allegations of what was said as being the person that does enforcement? No, I did not. Okay. Why is that? Um, I, it was not raised to my attention. I should have been, I could have been proactive. It just was not something that ra was raised to my attention as something that I need to look at. Well, I really, I really asked you that question. So, <sighs> correcting and conflict of interest and in questioning questionnaire, you mentioned that uh, you want to do communication of transparency. Um, can you just elaborate? Sure. So, for example, I know that um, I know that beneficiaries have expressed that they don't understand certain things about the HHL and it's it's usually a process that impacts their daily life, right? A lease transfer, yeah. a successorship. They don't understand why the HHL may move in different ways depending on the facts, right? Whether or not there is a designated successor, whether or not that particular designated successor perhaps doesn't actually meet the NHQ qualifications um, I do believe that DHHL can be better at explaining those steps along the way because there does seem to be this perception that DHHL acts arbitrarily, so perhaps, or there's no rhyme or reason to why they do what they do. And it is, it's a, it's a consequence of being, um, you know, um, of having not enough staff and not enough time, but it's also a consequence of not having, I think, and, and this is going to be kind of my thing over and over again, it's a consequence of perhaps not having processes or updated processes mm -hmm. that clearly help the staff process something from A, B, C, D, that, and that is, and that can be clearly communicated to a beneficiary so that they do understand why it is that their, you know, a successorship mm -hmm. has to go out to public notice or why a successorship is taking the route that it's taking. Um, so I can appreciate the frustration, you know, the perception, because I, as commission counsel, I sit during the meetings and I hear the J agenda issues that come up and, and they're kind of the same issues, you know, delays in response, not understanding why the department took a certain action. And the department usually has a reason, but it may not have been well, well articulated in a way that we would hope to, so that the beneficiary, perhaps they don't like the they're, they're not going to like the answer, but at least they understand where the department is coming from. Thank you. Go ahead. It was again about 600. 600. Okay, I, I, well, I just, <clears throat> I wanted to explore uh, conflict of interest. Sure. Um, you're not aware of any, so what, what could come up that could be a potential conflict? Well, there's the conflict of interest of the pecuniary type, right? Where I have or become, um, where I, I don't have any right now, but if I say have a business interest um, for which I am financially compensated, that is. Um, but you don't have. But I now. don't have any right and now. And you don't plan to. And I don't plan okay. to. Okay, so you, that's under your control. So yes. I'm just trying to think of what could. Um, what about a? <clears throat> are there? Legal interests, I would assume, that uh, may not be equivalent between the state attorney general and the Hawaiian Homes Commission. And if you have possessed information, so that's the first question, I guess. What, where, what kind of um, uh, legal differences mm -hmm. would the two, uh, the state versus the commission, have? So, you know, different legal interests. Where, where, if there would conflict, and then if you had a role in one or the other, would, would you have to, if, 
It depends on the details, I guess. It would have to depend. It would probably be a case by case basis. So there are things that, for example, when I advise the commission, um, if there were things that were discussed in executive session and they're discussing liabilities, et cetera, with their attorney, and I was the attorney who advised them, in that role, I cannot divulge sure. what happened there. So, um, uh, and, and the same thing for the department, right? And so there might be issues that perhaps if I advise a certain way and, so let's say I advise the department a certain way and the commission wants to go in a different direction, then I might have to remove myself or, or wall myself out from influencing any policy decisions because it's, you know, the commission ultimately has the authority to decide policy despite whatever legal advice the department had been given. Because you're at, you're a deputy AG in a couple of capacities, I wanted to ask how well developed is the conflict of interest, legal conflict of interest field? Uh, how much expertise, I would imagine over the years, there'd be a lot of situations where the, the, I'm not sure if it's a memo or if it's a practice or you, or you folks are trained or is there someone who's responsible to manage the conflict of interest? Or particularly if you're not sure, you consult with someone who is more of an expert. Is there an in-house expert? There is. So the, there's in-house processes. And I, I only know as a low, low Indian in the chain, but I do, under, I do know that there's a process. And for example, as a DHHL attorney, we were walled off from certain cases, most notably the Nelson case, right? Um, we were not involved. We were walled off. We weren't privy to any kind of information um, that the that the team who was addressing the Nelson case on behalf of the state was was um, dealing with. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I have a few. Um, you know, I was very um, intrigued and happy to hear the testimony. Um, of, of Chair Kali Watson at, at his confirmation hearing where he talked about, um, at least from what I understand what he was saying is that one of the ways that you folks want to really expedite, you know, getting, getting housing built is by practically like bypassing DPP. That's what I think he was saying, you know, issuing your own permits mm -hmm. and um, I don't know if that would include bypassing Shifty. Um, but if so, um, are you folks going to do like an MOU or how do you, what's, what's, do you have any, I don't know if you've discussed this with him at all yet, but we haven't. It would be very conceptual, but yeah, um, because I'm not exactly sure, and he would be the developer, <laughs> subject matter expert, but I guess from a legal perspective, right, the reason why DHHL doesn't have, DHHL does not have its own um, system for permitting. Actually, in its rules, what it says, at least for, for residential, right, mm -hmm. is that um, it looks to the applicable county codes for for building type issues and they ask and when Elise like wants to do something with regard to um, adding to their house, et cetera, et cetera, we actually or DHHL, my understanding is that we rely on those permitting offices because we don't have the ability to um, either we don't have the subject matter expertise to to go in and know what building codes, you know, should be enforced, et cetera, et cetera. And so there is a, a absence there. And so, yeah, we would have to make sure that anything we do on our own is in coordination with those various county offices, because there might be a situation where we need them nevertheless to, to sign off on something. And that might not be like the actual housing. There might be issues with like, our developer needing to get certain, um, trying to think of the word, like easements mm -hmm. through a development, streets, utilities, things like that, right? That isn't necessarily under the umbrella of a DHHL land use exclusion. Mm -hmm. so, Are there any like third party contractors that you folks could maybe go through and have them do the permits? So I think sometimes that's allowed, right? I believe that Chair Watson is looking into that as one of the solutions and how to handle that kind of issue. Yeah. Okay. And, and then in light of that, I know that a couple sessions ago we passed a bill that finally required the counties that within 60 days um, of you folks um, building something, that as long as it's the county standards, they have to take dedication. 
mm -hmm. um, of the infrastructure. And and so I hope that that's been happening because I know like in areas like Papakolea and many, Nanakuli, all those other areas, and hopefully in these going forward, if you're going to do your own permitting, um, how's that been working? Has the 60-day deadline been been working and been enforced? Well, the key, I think, from what I understand from our LDD division, the key is in the fact that DHHL has to bring our sewer systems up to code. So that's on us. So that depends on funding, that depends on the resources, you know, the contracting for those upgrades, et cetera, et cetera. And once they are upgraded, then I believe we can dedicate to the county. So that's actually where the kink and delay is. It's not necessarily the actual dedication, but it's in getting our, you know, sewer systems, you know, in that particular example, up to the county's um, requirements oh, before we can okay. dedicate. Okay. And the other thing that I was really excited to hear from Chair Watson was about, you know, this whole, there's been so much talk about dying on the wait list, you know, and with 28,000 and, um, and, and, you know, there's such a big concern about that. And um, But one of the things that he's talking about that I thought was really exciting is you know, really expanding the Kapuna housing and kind of departing a bit from what's what you've what the, the project you have in Waimanalo where rather than pure rentals, mm -hmm. um, and he wants them to be leaseholds mm -hmm. so that the Kapuna could actually pass it on to successors and then that, that family would lose their place in the wait list. Um, and now, but I know in the past that has been legally challenging, I think, for DHHL mm -hmm. when you have a multifamily, um, you know, type situation, um, multi unit. And so, is that something that you folks think is going to be possible? And is it going to be like, you think leasehold or rent with option to purchase, or do you have any 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 ideas that, that you might think that to make it work so that Kapuna could actually have a lease rather than a rental? I would have to really look at it and look look through it. So, what's interesting is that, for example, with the Eisenberg property, mm -hmm. um, as I said, it was eight years altogether. There was a two year gap. Where, um, because I moved to Maui, I was actually with the Child Support Enforcement Agency Maui branch, so I wasn't with DHHL. And it's interesting because right before I left, I was aware of what was happening with Eisenberg, and at the time, the discussions did involve trying to figure out how to make these units leasehold. And I'm not <coughs> even sure what happened because when I came back, it was a rental project. So I would need to understand where and what happened in the analysis. And um, but you know, I think. From what I understand, there is this idea that we would, you know, the thing about condos, right? DHHL is fee owner, the condo as a leasehold unit, there they would be fractional interests in the airspace, right? That's how condos work. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you can have a fractional interest in the fee, right? And then you can buy a condo unit, fee simple. But what we're talking about here is actually only having the condo, the condo unit would be a leasehold unit. But I think what I heard Chair Watson say, and I'd have to talk to him after this because we haven't <laughs> talked, but is that his idea is actually to do um, undivided interest, factual interest for the fee. Um, so that's a different concept altogether, and I'd like to explore if that's feasible. I, I don't know at this point. Okay, <clears throat> but I think that's, that's a very, very exciting thing. Um, and then I guess one more thing is that I'm glad you mentioned the enforcement issue because um, I know that, you know, Civil Beat did an article about the, the bill that you folks, one of your, your package bills, because, you know, there's so much confusion among law enforcement and also among um, the, the beneficiaries about who you call when there's like a game room on your street or, you know, what do you do when there's some drug dealing going on. And what I heard you say on the House side was that there's MOUs that, that DHHL might be pursuing with the different county mm -hmm. police departments. and so. How does that work? What do these MOUs um, entail? Well, there's only one that I know of, and it's quite dated. So it's like it was done in 2002, um, and and it was actually light on the in the actual criminal enforcement part. There's definitely a section that says, you know, County of Hawaii and DHHL have an agreement that County of Hawaii can enforce its laws, and there would be kind of a partnership as far as criminal prosecution. But that MOU actually had a lot to do with an understanding of our of actually land use, right? We have we are always running into issues, confusion over, you know, what we will submit to, you know, because county is in charge of things like um, 
CZ, CZMA type issues or SMA type issues, right? Um, and DHHL has always been like, but you know, we have exemptions to those kinds of things, or that's the position, right? Mm -hmm. So that MOU actually is more geared towards that, um, but it does exist. And, it's, and to my knowledge, it's only County of Hawaii. Um, I was informed that we, that, and I'd have to go and talk to the planning office that perhaps planning has been negotiating with County of Honolulu, City and County of Honolulu, for the same type of um, agreement. Um, I don't know what efforts there have been in Maui County or Kauai County along the same lines. Um, so it would be a matter of, of reaching out and seeing if that's something that we can, can do. Um, to my knowledge, um, Kauai and Maui, we don't have, there haven't been overtures that I'm aware of. Okay, because at this point in time, I mean, the testimony I heard from like Homalami Shadell and others was that like, now, you know, if you're a beneficiary and you have some kind of problem in the homestead, and if you call HPD, um, sometimes the HPD will say, we don't have jurisdiction. So when they contact like us, should we tell them to call DHHL enforcement officers, or should they be calling um, DLE or the calling well, HPD. I mean, that would be, that's kind of the idea. That's why DLE opposed uh, DHHL's original version of the bill, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're supposed to come online next year on the 1st, January 1st, 2024, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, and the, or 20, sorry. 20. 20. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and the idea was that, you know, and basically their testimony was that we're going, you know, we're going to be the state law enforcement arm. And so, but I think that's what Auntie Homilani testified to. It's like, well, then what number? Well, 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 actually, like who? Like what number then? Like you know. And so we would have to, in my position as deputy, that's actually something that I can do, right? I can make those interagency relationships, um, especially if compliance is one of the, one of the areas of which, is the deputy's focus, right? And and work with DLE closely if that's basically the the way that the statewide enforcement wants to move. Um, that doesn't so I, I want to be careful because that you know um, that's not there yet, right? We're not there yet. So in the meantime, what we have with the fact that the bill, um, the current compliance bill was was um, deferred is that beneficiaries still have to rely on their respective county police departments when things like that happen. Mm. Okay. All right. Vice Chair, do you have more questions? Yeah, how much time we have? <laughs> okay, just a few more. Um, just going with that, um, I want to stay on that topic for now because it was in my head. I was going to ask it later on the enforcement. Um, for now, um, Stacy, can you come up, please? The reason why I'm calling you up is because I know you work hard as the representative of Nanakuli, of a home in uh, Nanakuli. How did um, the transpire? Did anything, the enforcement, did anything go well with that house or is that house still in operation? Um, I believe that it's, I think it's still, I, I think it's still being, it's still in oh, yeah. court, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Okay. I just wanted to get clarification. Yeah. Okay. Because they're battling on the assumption of there wasn't doing illegal activity. Okay. I, I don't, I don't get to talk anymore. <laughs> okay. let, let me, let me do that and I get myself in trouble. Anyway, the reason why I bring that up is because that was a years mm -hmm. of even directors being passed. And that's the reason why I was very much so in liking the idea that you guys want to have you guys own enforcement. A lot of the beneficiaries didn't understand it, but it's not that we try to uh, police them and keep them off the land. Um, I mean, that's the, that's the truth. <laughs> anyway, so reason for that is because Sex trafficking, gambling, illegal drugs, all of those things happens in these communities, not just Hawaiian homes, happens in my non-Hawaiian home community. But the difference is, like I'll give you an example, in my community, we had a gambling house took, opened about maybe October, November, 
Um, we got on top of it, worked with HPD, and the house is closed. But because some of these guys know the loophole, for us, we have to have HPD do long intensive um, investigation, have to have somebody that witnesses it or whatever forward that we're going to have a better plan because I couldn't wait. I told the guy, he talked to me in the way I'm hearing about the collaboration with you guys, but I still said no because I really feel that, you know, you guys don't know how to feel about Hawaiian Homes. Hawaiian Homes is, is a special entity that should be treated as such and get things expedited because most of those guys wait years to get on the list. They don't even gambling house opening over there three days later. And then the quality of life of the whole family going on the tubes because HPD has a loophole and they can't go and do certain things in Hawaiian homes. And that's why I was for that for that bill. I thought that bill was great. Um I just 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 wanted to make that, that observation. So I just want to go back into my questioning. So I know you talked about um the uh, um Transparency, but just let me just, just let me read it this way. You can do it on your own. So describe on what um, envision of your role to eliminate the appearance of the conflict. You said a little bit of that. And the reason why I want to bring it up: conflict of interest, and to improve transparency because the HHL has this big cloud hanging over on, on all kinds of allegations and unproven fact because people are not happy. Um, as your role, as you talked earlier, um, besides um, what you just explained, can you elaborate more on um, your role in trying to bring back that confidence back to Hawaiian homes? Was it? I, I don't know how long it, well, the cloud was there, so. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, so it, it's not going to be easy, right? And I am going to try my hardest, perhaps probably by just sheer, sheer will of force, but um, the the or force of will excuse me the the idea is that we have we are short staffed you yeah. tell the short staff yeah. we need we need to staff and i know that's part of um chair watson's plan is to staff us up appropriately that's what we're all advocating for we really need to have the staff but once staff is there we also need to invest in training we need to we need to bring the skill level up you know we need we need to have staff, even even those who are like homestead assistants, um, the civil service who are able to write well, speak well, be able to explain a process um, so that, and it, it kind of ties into my earlier answer, right? So that everyone is capable of explaining and understanding what it is that they're, why it is that we do what we do. So in a you know, in my previous life in the private sector, I actually had a, um, a mentor and he had this story of the half ham. And the story, and I'll try to make it short. The story basically is that, you know, a man would, every Christmas a man would get a ham, cut it in half, throw it in the oven. His wife never understood that. And the answer was, well, my mom always did it this way. So finally the wife asks, asks the, the mom, why do you, why, why, what, what's the trick? And the mom was like, oh, I did that because our oven wasn't big enough, right? So, and it's like, so you have to start with why. Why do we do what we do? And sometimes, and, and as an attorney, asking the staff sometimes with issues that they brought to me, why are you doing it this way? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm looking, I'm looking at the rules. I'm looking at the law. Do you guys have any processes? What is the policy here? And it goes back to... They don't have a why and I would like to work mm. so that our staff have a why there's a workflow there's a process there's a reason why we do this it's not it's not left up to fate that you get somebody who's very good versus somebody who's maybe not that great right when you when you call or when you're being assisted by a homestead assistant so that that is where I see myself putting in the hard work to make DHHL much more efficient much more transparent the reason why I asked this is that in a previous past, um, directors would hire um, family and instead of they staying in their lane like Paula Isla, she would do about 100 different things and make everybody scared. Um, and you know, I know. And not staying in her lane. So I hope you, with, with uh, Chair Kali Watson, would vet good people and actually want to be there to help the beneficiary and the trust instead of being there because you belong to a family. 
or your family to somebody and you're working there. Because I know firsthand, not only with Joby, but with Paula, how much time we almost lost in the house of because of lack of uh, enthusiasm, um, time crunching and doing their job because they're too busy worrying about other people's job and not worrying about their own. So I just hope and pray that when you guys do find these great um, people that want to work and improve the quality of life of our people, that we find that kind of people. Because I'm just tired of, of the same old, same old. Like you said, how are we going to get the transparency when your cousin is a chair? I mean, there's not going to be nothing like that. And then when they don't answer the phone, they're all pointing fingers at each other. So that's one of the things that I appreciate. So, um, and that's... Um, uh, Senator Cahill, Kololi, get any more? Because I have some more. Yeah, I think he, he has questions. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I'm Kololi. I get quite any questions. No. Well, so this is more commentary, but I'm not the vice chair anymore, and this is the mm -hmm. Senator Favela seat before. So, <laughs> the you know your half ham story reminds me of the appraisal problem that the department seems to encounter, where you have homesteaders who are listing their leases for sale on the market for other beneficiaries to potentially purchase for listing prices, sometimes two hundred percent over the appraised value because of this, you know, because of the appraisal methodology as it relates to leasehold property. So prior to the pandemic, we went and we went and asked the appraisers why they apply that methodology. And they said it's because the banks require them to. And we asked the banks why, and it's because they said HUD required them to. And we went and we looked up with HUD why HUD put in place those appraisal methodology requirements. And they said because it's the Department of Hawaiian Homelands that said it was required. And then the department said it's it's because the appraisers said they needed to do it that way. Yeah, I would like to stop that kind of nonsense. Part. Thank you. I, I I mean, if so, how would you propose doing that in that specific case? Because because you have you have homestead beneficiaries on the wait list mm -hmm. who are waiting to purchase properties that are for sale for illegitimate, but also legitimate purposes. Because sometimes families got to leave the homestead. Yeah. And it behooves them to list the property for what they think it's worth. But if you're trying to buy a $600,000 listed house in Kapolei and you can only get financing on $300,000 worth of property, then the things are never going to sell. No one's ever going to acquire it. And the homesteaders are never going to get that kind of flexibility. It's very frustrating. It is. Well, I don't know the details. Um, I would have to go and look at the history, whatever you have looked at or and talked to. And I think it's an issue of trying to create or re-looking at perhaps a policy. Well, it sounds like maybe there is no policy other than just a, this is the, this is the memo from yeah. 1984 that, that we follow I, still. I think that there's a lot of that. There's outdated policies that we have lost the reason for or it doesn't make sense anymore maybe it never did make sense but we should look at those things and update them and be much more i do believe that dhhl a lot of the issues that frustrate beneficiaries quite frankly sometimes you know have frustrated legal counsel is because of these issues and if we know about them um hopefully having the experience that I have had now in this role, I can actually direct a course on a resolution that actually makes sense, right? I can present um, maybe uh, an updated policy suggestion to the commission to consider as far as why the whatever 1984 memo doesn't work anymore. Do you, do you consider it your individual responsibility to go out and establish ties with homestead communities apart from your uh, responsibility to work with the director? I do. Okay. I, I would like to. I haven't had the opportunity to do that. Why? Um, because um, the focus was on the interim chairs. Um, travel schedule and I and when he wasn't confirmed then a lot of the um, 
operational stuff I was at the office for and I just didn't feel like I could travel to Molokai or the big island and leave the department for long lengths of time but with Chair Watson now installed I do hope that I get the opportunity to go out and meet with the homesteads and know who they are. Um, I've had the opportunity to meet with a couple of them because I've been to community meetings now um, but they're all Oahu centric. I do want the opportunity to go to the neighbor islands and meet them as well. Well, so that's part of why I asked the question the way I did, because uh, even based off the testimony, it does seem like there are concern, concerns raised individually pertaining to you that exist separate from the chair's uh, own relationships and dialogue with the homestead communities. So, you know, in that case, it does seem like it might be necessary for you on your own volition to take some prerogative to go out and reach out and and meet with some of these homestead communities, many of whom have been very critical of me and and uh, that a lot of which was, you know, inadequate communication and what I deem to be misinterpretation of of both sides because we're not face to face and because I did not take the appropriate steps that I later did to go and meet with people individually in the Hawaiian style. Yes. So you are, so you are committing now to, to use your own intuition to independently go out and have these dialogues with these communities. Yes, I would like to do that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what's your well, just going along to what he said, I was going to bring it up later, but as an individual, I'll give you his name. Um, he comes before the commission often. He uh, bought, sold, bought and sold five different times um, Hawaiian homes, and each one he made a profit off each sale. That's the concerning that we have, and we need to stop that because we have people on the list, not, not just waiting there, but trying to figure out how is this person is accomplishing this. And I know at one time, and I hope he's still not there, and I'll give you the name to find out if he's still working there, but I heard he works for you guys in Hawaiian Homes, um, in one of the land division area. And um, he has preview, or his family has preview to that information. And he did that well, mostly in the Nanakuli area. Um, and um, he did it five times. And it's documented in the um, in your guys' commission um, minutes because it was brought up to me. I was going to bring them up to um, uh, Chair Kali Watson, but at the time it wasn't um, something that he, he was needed to know because you could be helping him with the enforcement. So that's why I'm bringing it up now since it's a concern of my colleague. Okay, um, so just a couple of more things. It has to do with. Uh, um, but what, what will you do to ensure HCDB to address the cleanup in the Kalailo um, parcel? So I need to find out what exactly is the situation there, but I do have some experience um, because I did, um, I did step in um, to help with the incident on Molokai, right? So there was mm -hmm. DOH and the crab property, mm -hmm. but then there was the neighboring property who also had concerns and, and actually the surrounding homesteads right, had concerns. Right, right, right. And so part, you know, one of the, one of the things that I have done is actually um, working with, you know, the, um, the, the various divisions and the people and the resource that we have in order to act quickly to, um, to move to try to address the situation for the neighboring um, property and home and BC. So, um, you know, I would hope that once I find out the facts that I can do the same thing, which is coordinate the resources that we currently have. For example, you know, I didn't even realize this, but um, I had tied in um, certain individuals who let me know that we actually had an open contract that could go to Molokai mm -hmm. in fast fashion, right? As opposed to having to weight and procure, et cetera. So those are the kinds of problem solving <coughs> solutions that you're only going to arrive at by asking, right? Not mm -hmm. by being insular, right? Not by the divisions being kind of their own silos. It definitely has to be more collaborative across the department. And the thing about it is that in my experience since being there, if you ask, they'll 
everybody is willing to pitch in. It's a team effort. It's knowing who to ask, identifying the issue and then knowing where perhaps to ask. And sometimes you ask somebody and they're like, oh no, you know, not me, but you just keep asking, right? So. Yeah, so how, how, um, on the crab property, how much of the contamination was contributed by his property? Oh, I don't know what percentage. I do know that we have reports from um, yeah. the DOH's consultant. Well, it, just, it, just, it just blows my mind because he came and testified, previously testified. He threatened my staff that back in the day, politicians would get assassinated. So I just wanted to see his character. And you know when he was doing that? Everybody on Molokai was going on my phone. That he's the biggest contaminator on the island of Molokai. So I might try to see if he can give me that information on how much you guys had. So the partial, the partial in uh, Kalailoa, do you know the actual value of that parcel? I do not. Can you please go look into that for me? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, I know you already talked about this, but um, this only reason why is what Senator Hill was talking about, um, that you need to kind of break bread. So I'm gonna go back to the eight years that you was at DHHL involving the Kalima case. And then um, he already kind of elaborated, but I'm gonna go and I'm not going to read this whole thing, but these guys are very, very upset with you. And you already know who probably they are. Uh, the Kadanis, um, Ronald and Doreen. You, you know about them? I, I do not know. Okay. So I just give you their names and then later on, I'm not going to read everything they said. Because I already talked to you prior and um, my conclusion is I understand they're very upset and very angry. And I just, my advice to you is the same thing as Senator Heo Kololi says, is to go break bread with these guys because sometimes as leaders, we make decisions and you see it all the time in a paper. We be called bullies and names and all that kind of stuff, yeah? But the perception is not true. And my interview with you, I'm just gonna say that, I, and I found you of what been said in here. So, to just clarify, just do me that favor if you can, and um, um, try to see if you can break bread with these guys and, and uh, do what Senator Kehoe Kodole said. So just going back on that, uh, what is the process of where the settlement for that beneficiary is on the Kalima case, do you know? I do, so okay. um, my understanding is that, so if there's a settlement, right, and yes. right now it's, and it's still in the court, right? So the court is overseeing the um, settlement process so I believe what is happening right now is that the plaintiff's counsel is um, working with the claims administrator, um, who is a mainland firm, firm Epic, um, to process all of the information. And so Epic is actually doing the class notices, um, things like that, um, to the uh, Kalima claimants. And there's actually several um, court approved um, parts, I guess, of the settlement. So there's a special master, there is the claims administrator, and my understanding is in some that um, they are working on a distribution plan and that is going to be before the court for final approval in July of 2023, is my understanding. Okay, so the only reason why I brought that up is because of you, what you just said, again, reports from the beneficiaries that they've been told by DHHL staff to contact council staff um, when they are calling the referred council, they are being told to contact Kalima Settlement Administrator on the continent. Um, and if that is true, uh, with our, our saying our 382 million, our beneficial settlement of money is being handled from somebody from the continent. and. Um, Beneficiaries for, for years that they, you know, they're just feeling, I don't want to use the word that was written here, but um, they're just feeling that um, they're being misled. <laughs> um, and that with um, needing to deal with someone from the continent, they don't feel that, you know, this is our kuleana, yes, I don't know why um, we have to go to outside sources to the fact that um, to handle something that is so sensitive and delicate, you know, very, I mean, very 
these guys are very troublesome. A lot of them, including the person that I told you about, um, since that um, incident with the family, they said over thousands of the families died on the um, Kalima case. So I, I just like to know how, um, you know, what, what decisions are you going to make or try to make working with um, Chair Kali, try to bring that back home. I, I'm not understanding why can you explain to me why did we go? I mean, of course, it's not his Kuliana because he wasn't there yet. But I am asking both of you guys to bring this back where it should be because it started here. And to bring back the feeling to the families that this would be handled by our people and not somebody on the continent that don't know all of the ins and outs of this case. And we're trusting somebody to distribute, distribute the money or part of distributing the money. I have no vested interest besides being paid to do so maybe. So can you can you explain that to me? Sure, so the thing is, when it comes to this part of the process, the I would suggest that the concerned beneficiaries get in contact with their council. They are represented, claimants are represented, they're a class and they're represented by a class council. So these kinds of concerns should be brought up to their plaintiff's counsel because the plaintiff's counsel was the one who sought the court approval for the use of the claims administrator for the special master. And so I'm not sure how much DHHL has influence, quite frankly, mm. about those things. I mean, court of you know, so the, the, the court, the court, the court, the court decision to go with. Yes. Yeah. So they were they were, you know, the claims administrator was presented as um, as the you know the company that would assist the plaintiff's counsel in this role and so you know beneficiaries who are having issues with um having to go to the mainland or being con or having to contact the mainland should probably raise these issues to their um to their class counsel okay it's just a few more um how would you handle the situation that the staff that they determined determined Current uh, leaseholder, like each, not just that, but it, since I'm always on that topic, so we use it as an example. Um, licenses holders of like um, licenses that have like HCDB, um, having the how would you how are you going to work with the staff on that situation on these guys who are having the license now that um, Kali is going to step down from um, the organization? Um, did you guys meet? any contact where you guys are working with them because apparently he's not going to be able to because mm -hmm. he said he's going to recuse himself because that would be a conflict so that probably would be falling upon you as the deputy so how how are you going to be handling the situation when it comes to determine of the lease for that um with hcdb i would have to work with the appropriate staff so i believe that would be under the lmd process i'd have to see where they are yeah. in the application process um yeah, we. I mean, we haven't had a chance to talk about these issues, but we probably do have to establish some kind of wall or something like that to make sure that um, if if the lease or license, as the case may be, is awarded to HCDB, that you know it that it's because they've met all of the um, required boxes, just as any other licensee would have met. Okay, so this what what is the law regarding? state land holders and they have violations with their licensing. The reason why I bring this up is I brought this up before. Prior to um, Chair Watson, um, he didn't, and regardless if the disagreement on his license, um, he didn't pay it for a while. And then of course he paid it now and inside the emails that we had from DHHL talks about if he doesn't pay it, they ask him to vacate if he doesn't pay it, he's not going to be able to acquire. Now, not just, I just, like I said, because that was a topic that I had brought up, but if there's any license or leases that is not, um, would they be able to acquire any more land if there's any problems with the license or leases? I'd have to check because I actually don't know the answer to that. I don't know if there's an actual policy, and that's part of, you know, that's part of, what we've been talking about generally, yeah, yeah. right? Looking into 
processes for when for when especially for the land management side the unencumbered types of properties right how does it go from or you know how did and, and there and there's other issues is the thing right. it's not just this license yes. it's ROEs that have yep. come up yep. and stuff yep. like that is when does LMD send it or basically pull the trigger as to like evict right moving yep. forward yep. with it I'm not sure that there actually is a process other than when a land agent yeah. honestly gets to it, unfortunately. Yeah, no, so yeah I, no, to, I understand this. So the only reason why I'm saying is at the time when this was happening previously to ILA and whatnot, uh, day to day operations handled by the chair of the HHL. And this is the reason why I brought it up. And like I said, this is no, nothing against uh, Kali and his successful businesses is just that when you talk about transparency and being clear we just want to make sure that he can be able to, we don't want to have him handcuffed or stop doing what he can do best for our beneficiaries if his hands going to be tied when it comes to this kind of stuff that we're going forward so with the current um lease or license holders to be eligible to enter in any other land agreement for state land. What, what I mean, what what would be their current um, obligations or being obligated to to be following before you can go into any other lease or licensing agreement with AHHL? Okay, so I think, okay, so if I'm hearing correctly, and I think I said earlier that I didn't know whether or not there was a policy, so I, I would like to take that back because now that I'm rehearing it, mm -hmm. I do think that it is the policy, the standard operating procedure, basically, that in order to receive another yes. land disposition, that you have to be compliant on whatever other land dispositions is currently in your, under your name. The reason why I bring this up is that at, at this time, um, prior to his um, um, Chair uh, Watson's uh, nominee, he was, um, and it's in the emails that I got, I can highlight them and give it to you. It was told in the emails that um, you have to pay your back lease because you're not going to be able to uh, inquire 42 plus acres that it is in Campbell Industrial by um, with Gentry, Gentry, uh, Gentry uh, Owen Dredgery or by VIP, the property over there, I'm not too sure where it is on the tax map key, but I can send it to you later. So it actually was told to him by DHHL that if he wants to inquire any more acreage through his um, nonprofit, that he would have to take care of his um, violation and his back rent, and which he had accomplished on the uh, back rent partial um, part, but not on the um, the violation of the hazardous waste. So that's the reason I'm saying is because from the time I had asked him the question and prior to the time he being selected, this was in the process. And how I know this is because the families that wanted to for 10 years or more try to get this partial always got to run around. All of a sudden, they found out a nonprofit. At the time when they told me, I don't know abbreviations. So I just want to know going forward, um, how is this partial going forward prior to his, again, not being conflict of interest, having the requirements now. Now that he's not the head of it, how is his nonprofit, HCDB, his former nonprofit, is going to acquire this land without cleaning the violation? hazardous materials prior. So if there's anything that's going forward in the paperwork for this parcel, he needs to excuse himself from any of the dealing. And then this has to be notified and let go to the commission to let them know what is happening. Because a lot of this, don't, from what I look in the minutes, they never went to the commission for his violations of his back rent. Um, and it was because of the purview of the chair on the daily operations. So. I like to do all I can because he gonna get four to eight years of being there or how long he should be there. I want to make sure that not only the stumbling blocks that was being told to me, because I, I told him this before and uh, when we had this uh, whole situation before, I guess he didn't understand, but 
All of this what I'm getting is from beneficiaries and concern. And the two main ones, well, I had three. Two main ones is they came and testified. All the evidence and information that I got on Colleen Watson was from Patty to Ruya. Okay, so that's the reason why I want to let the chair know everything I'm doing here today and saying was from other people that have concerns. But again, in the hearing, he was still upset from the previous time when I had said something on top of a, of a Facebook Live interview with some guys from Kauai. And that's the reason why if we're going to break bread and go forward, he needs to do the same because today he addressed me and I, and I, and I respectfully understand that. But if we're going to go forward, we need to have this ongoing mutual respect. Because when he came to the hearing, he didn't address me at all. And that concerns me. You can go look at the hearing. Because he still was thinking that I have Pili Kea with him. And I don't. I don't know him personally. I don't have nothing personally against him. But he took it personally. But the people around you, Colin, just to say this, you got to watch. Because they the ones gave me the information. Okay, thank you, sir. That's all I have. Thank you for your time. This, this might have been... Uh, covered already. I acknowledge that I came in from something else. Um, came into this hearing already underway. Can you just clarify the nature of your work on the Kalima case? Certainly. So I was brought on um, October 2021. And at the time, so the Kalima, the second Kalima um, appeal had come down like mid 2020. And at the time there was a kind of an institutional loss at the AG. So um, no one from the previous litigation team um, who really worked on the case had been around. So there was kind of this new group. We hired SDEGS and then myself. And my primary role really was to try to by SDAGs, you mean? Um, sorry, um, Special Deputy Attorney Generals that we had hired to assist on the case. Specifically on, because it's litigation. Case, yeah. And so my role really was to try to, I was kind of like the, um, uh, the information gatherer. I was, I was tasked with finding where, you know, the files were, um, where all the information had been, um, because we were moving into the damages phase. And there were out, and you know, we came to learn that there were outstanding issues um, during the what was supposed to be the appeal period that we were supposed to meet and confer that weren't wasn't done, and so there was a lot of like um, issues going back and forth, understanding you know outstanding discovery requests and things like that. So actually, a lot of my time was spent um, working on. Um, meeting those um, very intense short deadlines to actually do the discovery request because it had to do with finding um, the applicable in order to measure damages right the applicable application date um, lease trans lease date if any lease or and there are issues right when somebody like transfers a lease so that might change the the date so I worked um, I that sounds like case, yeah. primarily case administration yes. type work. Yeah. So if you can help to refresh my memory and then make it clear for the, for the public who might be watching, uh, what's, what was the nature of Kalima 2 versus Kalima 1, if you can just... So Kalima 1 had, so there was, um, the case was kind of bifurcated, right? So Kalima, there was a liability trial, and so Kalima 1... Um, when it went up on appeal had to do with um, liability issues and which were pretty settled, right? The breaches of trust were established. DHHL did not win on that point, right? So How much the state on, on was the, liable yeah. for to these beneficiaries. Exactly. That was Kalima 1. one. And so Kalima 2 had to do with the applicable, um, how to um, value damages. So there was a lot of um, motions practice with regard to what was the applicable way to value claims and ultimately what Kalima 2 said was that it would be evaluated according to a matrix using the fair market rental value and so it's really it's so really the state in Kalima 2 the state had already lost yes already acknowledged that it lost yes and the discussion well the litigation 
because the state would have been the damages was around state. how much the state had to pay. That's right. And how you figure out how much the state had to pay. That's right. So before there was um, the opportunity to kind of globally settle all claims, it was about um, how are we going to logistically do this, right? Because um, the claims were. And so you're saying the, the majority of the nature of your work at the Department of the Attorney General around your involvement in Kalima was case administration around this Kalima 2 process to calculate damages to beneficiaries yes, and sir. to determine how to calculate damages. Well, the how to, to calculate damages is actually done because we would do it by the matrix. It's really, it was really about hammering out the applicable beginning point and end point for the cases because they weren't all consistent. It, it wasn't as easy as you would think that it should be. And actually, because some of the, yeah. is that because some of the plaintiffs, you know, applied to the department at different points or? Yeah, or, you know, um, applied or, or got a lease, not because um, they may have been on the wait list, but they got a lease not by a war, but because they, you know, came through through a transfer, like there were all kinds of different ways to interpret a beginning date and an end date. And so that's actually a lot of the work that actually continues into the settlement part of it. Because I worked on outstanding discovery issues. There were actually discovery that happened prior to me coming on board as well. And so these were like um, but but fundamentally, issues. if I could, mm -hmm. uh, and so keep me correct so that I don't overgeneralize. But fundamentally, your work at that stage of the case was on figuring out how much was owed to each of these beneficiaries by determining how long they had to wait unjustifiably due to the liability of the the negligence of the state. Yes. Okay. So can you respond to some of the opposition testimony and in your position now, you know, perhaps taking a look as, as the deputy uh, in hindsight toward your work at the attorney general's office on the case, can you respond to the concerns by some of the testifiers, homesteaders and beneficiaries who find it problematic that you were, so to speak, on the other side of uh, the beneficiaries in your work on that case? Um, so through my experience and work on the Kalima case and the fact that I was really in the weeds, I was in the, the details, I was looking at massive amounts of leases, um, trying to verify dates, applicable dates, um, you know, what was very apparent to me um, was that DHHL lacks systems. It lacks a cohesive way of keeping the information that it should be keeping about applications, about leases. Um, and that led to, and that, that, type of, that type of issues is one of the reasons why I would like to be the deputy to try to address those types of um, to address the inefficiencies of the department because it does take an inordinately amount of time sometimes to get a very, what should be a very simple um, answer just by looking at a file, but it's, it's, sometimes it's not. Well, I guess let me, let me be more specific, okay. right? Like I think some of the concern is around the fact that, you know, I think it would be probably fair to interpret your role uh, in the attorney general's office as even specifically as it relates to what you described your work was on Kalima, I think it would be fair to, to assume that part of your job was to minimize the ultimate amount of money that the state of Hawaii would have to pay off to these beneficiaries. I think that is the, from what I read in the testimony, that seems to be the concern. And because to my prior you know, question to you, I think for some of the specific individuals that I know that submitted testimony in opposition, 
uh, it doesn't seem like you have been able to go out and sit with them face to face. So they don't know anything about you. Mm -hmm. They don't know your ano, they don't know your explanation for your role and what you felt your responsibilities were. And so can you speak to what I think could fairly be considered as, you know, your role as the lawyer for the state trying to limit the amount of money the state has to pay to beneficiaries? Yes. So it's true. Um, my role as representing the the department was to you know as a defense when it comes to damages mm -hmm. the general role of the defense attorney representing your clients vigorously is to mitigate right and that was so that was the position of the state right so there mm -hmm. were claims that um, perhaps and it wasn't really about you know the thing about it is that it there was a lot that we could agree on beginning date end date it was that it was the ones where um there were issues it was more like and i'm i'm it's been kind of a while so sure. it's there are ones where there were like more jurisdictional issues right they didn't meet particular jurisdictional ones that perhaps they weren't entitled to as much or anything um but regardless that all changed once we went into settlement mode so um and 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 so the position of the so yes my role was to mitigate that's the job the damage. That's that the was job. the job that's the job right so the question is how now that we acknowledge that was the job like how should how should beneficiaries feel about the fact that that was your job i do understand the concern and I do understand why without knowing me better and what I stand for outside of my job having been the Kalima attorney I mean what I would like to say is that um, you know I I would like to help DHHL be better because a well-managed trust you know having worked on the Kalima case and other cases like it a well-managed trust um, means um, that the beneficiary, you know, it, it serves the mission, which is to serve the beneficiaries. And Kalima was an example of a trust that was not well managed at the time. And we need to address those issues. The issues have not been fixed because of Kalima. They still exist today. And we need to have a much better run, more efficient department. And we need to look at solutions into how we, we address those. I don't necessarily have all the answers, but I know that I really, really, really want to try to to make sure that these kinds of breaches do not happen again. Thank well, you thank so you for that. I, um, if you are confirmed, I would hope that you do have the opportunity that you do take the initiative to go to go and communicate this to so many of these beneficiaries who maybe need to hear face to face from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just okay. one follow up to. And we do need to end. Yeah. 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 No, we won't, we won't end. Okay. <laughs> Next year. But anyway, <laughs> the, re the reason why I'm going to follow up on this is that what you're telling us and, and you, you, you're articulating what you, your role was is that's the reason why I think Senator Keho Kalole is saying this is because. Ovir says that you were the, one of the lead attorneys in the pursuit in opposition to Native Hawaiians' lawsuit against the HHL in the Kalima case. And that's, I guess, what he's talking about. I know it's been a long time ago, and people are feeling that you was the lead role player in trying to block their... I'm not saying you did that. I'm just reading what they said. And that's the reason why me and Senator Keo Kalole is saying that you know, have healing. I mean, we, we just got to figure out how we can do them. I'm not saying put yourself in danger or anything like that, but try try to reach out. That's that's all, that's all we're asking because it's, it's uh, you know what you're saying, everything that you want to do. And, um, you know, and I just pray that, you know, we have a great run this time, playing around with you and um, uh, Kali being the team for our Hawaiian people. Um, and I just, that's just what are we advising? If you can do for us, um, other than that, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I, I would give my hundred more questions. <laughs>
Thanks so much, members. But yes, unfortunately, do need to end because of um, time limits on our hearing lots. So, without further ado, I'm going to recommend that we advise and consent uh, to Katie Cat as the chair. Sure. Huh? Or, oh, oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, waiting for your heart to return, I guess. Okay. 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 Yeah, I'm going to recommend we advise and consent. His office right there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I heard his door. Okay, just check it, just check it. I saw like you running. <laughs> okay, okay, good, 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 perfect. perfect. His feet. Okay, okay, yeah, perfect, perfect timing. Okay, I'm going to recommend the advice and consent um, to Katie Cat as the deputy chair. Any questions or concerns? Okay, see none, Vice Chair. Okay. Chair Shubakuro? Aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Ihara? Aye. Senator Kiho Kolole? Aye. Senator Richard is excused. Motion is adopted. Okay, we are adjourned. Congratulations. Quick photo.